Hello and welcome everyone to our latest presentation on diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2 infection. There are two types of diagnostic tests which are commonly available for the SARS-CoV-2 infection. The first one is the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction that is the RT-PCR and the second one is the IgM and IgG ELISA that is enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. So coming first to the detection of viral RNA by the RT-PCR. It is the most commonly used and reliable test for diagnosis of COVID-19. This is a test which has been used from the starting of the infection. Samples can be collected from the nasopharyngeal swab, upper respiratory tract specimens, including throat swabs, endotracheal aspirates and sputums and recently it has been also tried from saliva. So we can see here this is the sample collection for nasopharyngeal swab. The sample can be collected from the nasopharynx by putting a swab through the nasal orifice. The same thing can also be collected through the oral route by from the oropharyngeal mucosa if the patient is intubated, then we can put in a catheter and take an endotracheal aspirate or if the patient is not intubated, we can ask the patient to cuff and examine the sputum. Now a variety of RNA gene targets are used by different manufacturers with most tests targeting one or more of this particular gene. This is the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The most common gene that is targeted in this RNA is envelope followed by the nucleocapsid followed by the spike protein, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and lastly the ORF1 gene. So the manufacturers they target at least one or more of these genes when they make a kit. So the thing that they do is something called the cycle threshold. So your cycle threshold determines whether the patient is a positive or a negative. So what is this cycle threshold? The CT is the number of replication cycles required to produce a fluorescent signals. It basically is the number of times they have to do this cycling to get a positive fluorescent signal. So the lower the number of replication or the CT that is there for the particular patient, higher is the viral load. It means that if there is a larger viral load uh, within less cycles, we will get a positive signal. So if we get the signal before 40 cycles, that is a CT value of less than 40, it is reported to be a PCR positive. Now this positivity starts to decline by week three especially with the nasopharyngeal samples and subsequently they become almost undetectable. Please keep in mind a positive PCR means that we have just found the RNA of the virus. It doesn't necessarily mean that the virus is viable. This is especially important to in terms of infectivity. A patient who has been found positive doesn't necessarily mean infective. The implications of this is also to be discussed further, especially when we do the PCR from the sputums and the stool samples. And there are also been reports of various aberrant presentations like patients who have been positive even beyond six weeks of initial positivity report. And there have been reports of patients who have been negative and then subsequently after some time they have become positive. What are the implications of this report? Does it mean that the patients are getting reinfected or they continue to be infective beyond three weeks or even beyond six weeks is not something which we know at this time. But for all practical purposes, we can take three weeks as a time beyond which the patients most likely are not infective anymore. So when can we join back 
to our work if we are tested positive especially healthcare workers so a healthcare worker can join his duties if at least 3 days that is 72 hours have passed since recovery so recovery here is defined as the resolution of fever without the use of fever reducing medications and improvement in the respiratory symptoms that is improvement in the cough shortness of breath and at least 10 days have passed since the first symptoms have appeared so if a patient fulfills these criteria then that person can go back to his work in a study of 205 patients with confirmed covid-19 infection the rt pcr positivity was highest with bronchial alveolar lavage specimen that is 93% sputum was positive up to 72% nasopharyngeal swab 63% and pharyngeal swab 32% so it is always better if you collect at least two samples one a nasopharyngeal swab and secondly a lower respiratory tract swab which can be either a, a et aspirate a bronchial alveolar lavage or if the patient is not intubated then a sputum so what are the specificity and sensitivity of this test so false negative results occur due to various reasons mainly two false negative primarily means that you have given a negative report to the patient but the patient actually has a disease this can occur in two conditions the first is inappropriate timing of collection of the samples if you have collected the samples early then there is a chance that you will not find the rt pcr to be positive this happens also if when the patient sample is collected very late especially beyond 3 weeks here you may find that the antibody is positive but the presence of the virus is no more there in the upper respiratory tracts so in these conditions especially if you are doing the test early or doing the test late you will find that the test is negative but it doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have the infection but the most important is the deficiency in the sampling technique especially for the nasopharyngeal swabs this happens because people tend to collect the nasal swabs more in place of the nasopharyngeal swab because they fear that the patient is going to cough and sneeze this results in negative reports when the patient may actually be having the illness specificity of most the of the rt pcr is 100% because it is based on the primer design specific to the genome of the sars cov 2 but in spite of this we may find occasional false positive reports this are due to technical errors or the contamination of the reagent the second method by which we detect that a patient has a sars cov 2 infection is by detecting the antibodies to the virus in the blood of the patients so a covid 19 infection can also be detected indirectly by measuring the host's immune response to the sars cov 2 infection serological diagnosis is especially important for patients with mild to moderate illness who present late because by this time there is no more rna present in the nasopharyngeal or the upper respiratory tract so in this cases a serological diagnosis is more important igm and igg sero conversion occurs in all patient between the third to fourth week of clinical illness this has been proved in studies by to and jiang et al which included almost 100 patients following this increase the igm then starts declining and reaches lower levels by week 5 and almost disappears by week 7 igg persists beyond 7 weeks and it may provide us with long term immunity to the particular virus but this remains to be seen so what is the sensitivity and specificity for the antibody tests the sensitivity of pcr and igm elisa directed at the nucleocapsid antigen is 98% versus 51% with a single pcr test this is especially important for patient who is coming beyond the second week of clinical presentation in this cases the chances of getting a elisa 
positive is much more than a PCR. So here we can see that the sensitivity of combining the two tests is much higher than doing a simple PCR. During the first five to six days, the quantitative PCR has a higher positivity rate than the IgM antibody. But beyond the six days, the chances of getting a antibody test positive is higher than a PCR. ELISA-based IgG and IgM have greater than 95% specificity for diagnosis of COVID-19. Majority of the antibodies are produced against the most abundant protein of the virus, that is the nucleocapsid. Tests that detect the antibody to the nucleocapsid are considered to be the most sensitive. However, the receptor binding domain of S, that is RBDS protein is the host attachment protein and antibody to this is more specific and is expected to be the one that is actually producing immunity against the virus or the one that is neutralizing the virus. Therefore, using one or both antigens for IgG and IgM results in a higher sensitivity. Antibodies, however, may have a cross reactivity to the SARS-CoV and other coronaviruses. So we cannot say that they are specific only to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. The presence of neutralizing antibody can only be confirmed by plaque reduction neutralizing test. However, high titers of IgG detected by ELISA have been shown to positively correlate with neutralizing antibodies. So if you have a very high titer, you don't need to do specific tests to establish that these antibodies have neutralizing capacity. The long-term persistent and duration of this protection confirmed by the neutralizing antibody remains unknown. So to summarize, this was the viewpoint which was published in JAMA last week. So this is the summary diagram. The first towards the left side, what you find is the gray zone. This is before the patient develops symptoms. It is very difficult to detect a patient in this particular time period. It can only be done if you are doing an active surveillance. You have actively tracking that patient following a exposure to a positive case. So as you can see, detecting the virus is mainly done by the nasopharyngeal swab collection. As you can see here, it is denoted by the blue line, while the pink line denotes the bronchial velar lavage and the sputum PCR. So the nasopharyngeal swabs tend to become positive earlier, followed by the bronchial lavage PCR. By week three, there is a sharp decline in the positivity rate of the nasopharyngeal samples, though the sputum samples continue to be positive beyond three weeks also. So if we are planning to do an early detection, there is a very high chance of getting the patient by doing a nasopharyngeal sample, which is actually being practiced most of the places. Viral isolation is not something which is actively done. It is a difficult process and not something which is being done right now during the pandemic. The next thing that to note is the stool PCR. As you can see, the stool PCR also becomes positive, but the most important factor to be noted is that it continues to be positive beyond six weeks also. So what is the implication of the persistent of the viral RNA in the stool and the sputum samples? We don't know yet. Do these uh, viral RNA are actually for, from a viable virus? It is unknown. Most likely the viruses are non-viable beyond the two weeks. So the persistence of the RNA in the stools and the sputum samples do not represent uh, infectivity risk. The other test that we need to focus on is the antibody test that the IgM and IgG, these are detected by the dashed lines. They start becoming positive by week two or by week four of the total illness, week two of after the patient has developed symptoms. So they tend to increase and by fifth week to seventh week, the IgGM has completely disappeared. 
the IgG persists, but the long term protection against the virus of the IgG is not yet known. From, from diagnostic point of view, if a patient presents beyond the third to fourth week of illness, then the chances of getting a positive result is more if you combine the antibody and the PCR tests. So if the patient comes early in the illness, that is a patient is asymptomatic or has just developed symptoms, then it is better to go for a nasopharyngeal sample and a, a lower respiratory test sample, which is either a sputum sample or a endotracheal aspirate or a bronchial level Lavage sample. If the patient has come to you beyond 10 days, then it is better to combine an antibody test with a PCR test, which can be either a nasopharyngeal or a sputum sample and combining the two results results in a more higher sensitivity rather than going for a single PCR test. So thank you for your patience. Check our website for further information. <laughs>